<laughs> this is great to have you here. Uh, and uh, it's particularly interesting, I think, in that the work you're doing in residence here at the Walker and in Minneapolis, and the work you're performing at the Southern Theater over three performances, um, was work that, I, that I've been you know, in partnership with you on and uh, involved with as a commissioner, um, particularly faith and science. And so I thought we could maybe start, um, there's some bigger general questions mm -hmm. about the landscape and dance in general that I'd like to talk to you about. But just to put it, the parameters around it, tell us about, let's talk a little bit about just what you're doing here this week. Okay. Um, you're in residence for a week and we're halfway through this week. Um, you, we open, you open tonight at the Southern Theater for three performances. But we were just talking for a few minutes about um, your experiences here so far. And you started your week with a talking dance session at Intermedia, which the Walker helped put together with Daniel Negrin and uh, some artists based locally here. Joel Brenner was involved and others. Uh, Elena and Marcella. And Marcella, yeah. And so how did that, how did it go? How was it for you? Well, it was really the concept of text in dance, but also writers about dance and things, right? And yeah, actually what was interesting is that Pamela, who uh, was the moderator, I think she really did let it wander. And although I think several of us thought we were going to talk about writing, really where it went and where it stayed for a long time was on the text question. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Whether and text, how text how functions in work and in dance work. work and why and da da da. Right. And, um, I think what was sort of, uh, now, being in it, I don't know what it would have been like for the people out there, but for me being in it, what was fun was um, the extent to which I consistently disagreed with Daniel, which is what I knew <laughs> would happen. <laughs> and, and did you know Daniel before? Uh, I, I have a history with Daniel, and it was uh -huh. so funny. We, huh. we, um, in, the best, in the best way, I feel like I both disagreed with him and also um, agreed with him when I could. But, uh, right. Uh, it was funny. I, 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 and he's in, he's in residence with a, um, it's one of the McKnight Fellowships, yes. I believe. Yeah. So, yeah. And he's so, in, in, what's interesting to me ultimately about Daniel, in addition to how much he's given the field and what right. a courageous person he's been, is that there's a lot about him and me that's alike in vision and goals. The way we get there, how we do it, there's so many aspects of that that are really different. And hmm. if if anybody there would like to write about that, right. I think you'd come up against generational huh. male-female differences um, and actually the difference in some ways between modern and postmodern hmm. um, sensibilities. Right. In some real ways, he's a real classicist uh, in the best sense, and hmm. I am not. And it was just very interesting. But it came up around um, questions of text and like who should, who should be allowed to perform text and only people who are trained should be allowed to do text. To write text as well as perform well, vocal, speak vocal, you know, uh -huh. and I came right back with these questions about technique. Right. And um, if I had spent all this time trying to get rid of my physical technique in order to find a truer base for my movement, the same I felt was true about vocal. And hmm. even though I didn't, I didn't have a trained voice, I felt like sometimes the authenticity of the untrained could speak to people. And so it was those kinds of things. That was it was. Yeah. It was really good. And um, what else? I, I felt like the the, the the crowd was a big crowd. Yeah, I heard it was a very good time. Yeah. We had, and I was in Boston these last two days, yeah. so that's unfortunately I missed it at the National Dance Project meetings. But I think that. Uh, I'm told that it was one of their better turnouts for one of the talking dance, and, and we had about, I don't know, 50, 60 people. Yeah, there. I would say definitely 60 people. Yeah. And they were also very active, wanted to talk, got involved, and... Uh, did, they they did you find them falling on the postmodern or modern side of things? I think they, I think there was a mix. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but I think there may have been more, if we pursued the question of gender and sort of those kind of issues related to gender, um, I think we probably there's probably more compatibility with my point of view than Daniel's right. in the room. Um, however, there were many more points of view than just Daniel sure. and me. And, right. and so that was just one issue. And then I think some other things that got cooking that were interesting were the questions of how you write in your own community, if you write, um, how, you know, the problems of a small community right. and handling that. And I, I have to say, again, I pushed a little bit to getting us away from thinking about reviewing. It does seem to me that as soon as people talk writing, they zero in on reviewing, and I just think that's the that that's just not right. the place to go. So it's really that that whole other side about writing about dance, because it really that that forum took on two big topics, and really two very distinct topics: one of text in work and dancers as writers and speakers in their work, and the other is 
writing right. about dance um, right. and, and all of those issues. So those were addressed as well. Yeah, yeah, and I think mostly, you know, it isn't that we skimmed the survey. I mean, we, we went down a little bit, but I think right. you definitely, you could see that there were a lot of flashpoints. Right. And people could easily have stayed with it longer, and, mm. and I, think, I think it was good. Huh. Yeah. And then um, yesterday, uh, or actually Tuesday, here at the Walker Arts Center, in a private closed um, session, you worked with our staff in a critical response process. And this is a, could you talk about your process, you know, the development of that process kind of briefly, but just to give some background about. Well, you know, it basically developed, I know you know because you've seen <laughs> me, supported I participated me and in and in fact, doing uh, this thing yeah. for so long. But, um, you know, it grew out of both uh, my concerns as an artist in terms of the nature of feedback and my concerns as a teacher in terms of what to say, when to say it, and my concerns as a colleague. Right. How, those, really, those three areas. And my, um, m mostly what I pursued to develop it was to make myself think about what it meant to me to have successful feedback. And it, I discovered that a measure for me of successful feedback is when I can't wait to go back to work. Hmm. When I just get me to the studio, I have so much to do now, as right. opposed to what usually happens after feedback, which is, why could I ever think I was an artist? Right. This is the stupidest thing I ever thought. I think right. I'm going to give up right now. I've been a charlatan my whole life. This is, you know, <laughs> which is actually more often what happens How, to people. Right. So, Either that or the third thing is the feedback is, you were great. Yeah, and, which is, yeah. okay. Right. <laughs> so, um, what was interesting, first of all, we, we were private staff except for the, we did two sessions. We right. did two. For one of them, the high school kids came. You, you had right, this incredible end. relationship with yeah. this high school and these kids showed up. And I have to say I was a little nervous because I was so geared towards the staff, plus I knew that George, the, right. the first artist, was going to do this piece about um, a sort of uh, coming out kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want, I knew how vulnerable he was, and I sure, did not want him to get razzed. And right. Like, you know, what yeah. did I know about these kids? Right. I didn't know these kids. These kids were fabulous. Hmm. They were fabulous. These and are kids part of our teen program, which is, we've really been working with this school actively, and yeah. You can tell. Right. They were amazing. And hmm. one of the things I loved about them being there was we, here we had all these professional artists, curator types right. talking about art, and then you had this group of high school kids. And the, again, the honesty, power, vision that these kids had to say to, right. in essence, and their courage. because George yeah. is only an, maybe a year older than these guys, you know, huh. was uh, really wonderful. I loved it. I was so sorry that they couldn't stay for the second one, but they couldn't. And did you walk people through a response to the work that George actually performed? George briefly? performed, and then, well, first I talked a little bit, and then I explained to them the process, and then George right. performed, and then actually Michelle from my company uh, facilitated with, I, I chimed in a little bit, but um, facilitated people learning the process using George's piece. Hmm. And um, I would say that it was effective in terms of learning. I think people, um, I think George was very moved by what hmm. people had to say to him. Um, and, and I think George also, he gave excellent example to me about what happens if you if you give too much of a certain kind of feedback, how a person shuts down and can't hear anymore. Right. Because in step four, when you can give opinions, sure. we went one too many opinions, and you could just feel him going down, and, and the, the defense is coming up, and also the way he responded. And I was able to just point out to people, I said, look, see this? Right. You see this? Okay, this is why. It's pointless, unless you just want to feel smart telling people what you think. Yeah, right. He's not hearing anymore. Right. So, what, what, you know, so that was pretty interesting. Then we went upstairs. And Douglas talked a little bit about his um, the, the dialogues exhibit, and and you really use this process to explore the issues of a, the curatorial issues in a visual art setting. Is this the first time you've done that it in is. a museum? It is, and it was um, fascinating. I wish we'd had more time because mm. we really had to cut it pretty close. But um, George talked. He felt the need to talk a little bit, and actually that in itself was interesting in terms of what he chose to say. And then we did the process, but I asked them what they felt they most needed to work on because I knew I wouldn't have time to do all four steps evenly, and they wanted to work on neutrality, which has to do with step three, when you have to ask a question of right. the person to get them to think about it, but you have to ask a neutral question. And uh, I wanted them to work on step one, which is when you tell somebody what about what they have done has meaning to you, huh. because I feel like we never do enough of that. We're all too busy for that. Right. And the art world is in particular, you think it's dorky to do that kind of stuff. The well, art, I, there's much less of it, I find, in the visual art world of that reaffirmation and, and the, as, emphasizing the positive rather yeah. than focusing immediately on what one feels is wrong, wrong. about something. But is that something you've observed since you've been here? Well, it's my first experience in, in a visual art mm -hmm. um, setting. I mean, it's just that people, um, 
there's, there's a limited time and people want to focus in on the things that need improvement. So. Yeah. Well, so step three went. Um, well, I did step one, and the one comment that got made that I really highlighted was, Doug had talked about how he felt the show moved these two artists in new directions and pushed mm -hmm. them. So one of the curators said is a meaningful thing. I had no idea that that had happened in relation to this show. I'm proud to be part of the Walker. I'm happy to be part of an institution that makes that happen. Hmm. And I just think that that's the kind of thing why step one is so important. Right. Because it was like this little binding moment for, in a good sense, mm -hmm. and an awareness that after all this, you know, dragging ourselves to work and all the overwork, and right. all the, right. you do have to come up every now and then and say, wow. We've done something we've here. Done yeah, here. right. This is great. So that was neat. And then they worked on their neutrality. Actually, I found them very good in their question asking. Right. What I found they didn't understand is that you can, and this is my new way of teaching it now, we go to step four and people state their opinions. I have an opinion. Do you want to hear it? Right. Yeah. Um, how many, every single opinion could have been stated as a question in step three. Hmm. And to show people how they could do that. Right. And that if they do it that way, they will have a better chance of their opinion being heard in step four. Hmm. That typically, if you ask the question in step three, you still may not get the answer you want, or you still may think the person hasn't heard that you really have a problem with it. Right. But they will listen to you so much better right. if you've asked the question first. And then we had a little bit of a talk about um, how to apply this. And they wanted to know how to apply it. And I gave them, a, and finally at one point they said, well, what if people don't want to hear the feedback that you have? Right. And that's when I said to them, well, I would say you go to them and you say, look, what part of this do you want to know something about? Right. And honestly, they all went, oh, huh. oh, it, it right. just hadn't occurred to them. I mean, it's, it's the fact it, that in the development process, an artist has certain areas that they know they want input on. In other areas, they don't, they want, don't want any. It may not be the right time. Or a report. You've written a whole big long report, and you have right. somebody read the report. You don't want to hear feedback on the whole report. Right. You want to know what about this paragraph. Right. Yeah. And you'll really listen to that paragraph. So that was, I think, rather revelatory for them, mm. and I think that gave them a lot of bounce to the right. steps when they left. Oh, that's great. It was like, oh, okay. There's and I think we had 50 people or there were, there were a lot of people, yeah. and they stayed. Yeah, that's really they great. They stayed. So well, I was very... Thank you for doing that. I, I mean, well, I had a great time. Of course, it's thrilling to me right. to think that this has any application anywhere. Outside and of a performing arts context. It just makes me so happy. Have you yeah. found that the critical response process, which you've developed and actually published, and is really your own step-by-step -step process to elicit feedback um, and to be able to make people comfortable um, artists in getting response to their work, has opened up for a lot of people I mean, an ability to get, to, to get um, their work to the next step? Uh, the, the examples that I have right now are some within the company and how right. we're using it. Um, the New York Theater Lab, which is where Rent came out of, right. called me. I went and did a weekend, hmm. a training weekend, because what they do is feedback. That's how they, they it's a developmental space, and hmm. they are ecstatic. Wow. So, in the, and now we've started to get calls from playwrights from other parts of the country. So that thrills me. I, I, have, I can't say the dance world has particularly opened its hmm. heart to it, and my perception about that is, that the dance world is, um, now this, I'm gonna t this is sort of a big generalization. And <laughs> I would say that choreographers are among the most articulate and intelligent people I know. So it always surprises me that the dance world is a little anti-intellectual. But it is. Hmm. My perception is. And that, therefore, a, a process that is rigorous as this one is in relation to thought and, and consciousness right. strikes some people as antithetical to the intuitive uh -huh. kind of physicality, kinesthetic thing that we do. literal um, Even though I think you can do all of that inside the process. Right. And for me, it's such a quick partnership between the two. It's not, a, to me, it's not an either or thing, but I do feel like that, that exists. So, as I say, mm. there's been less, but you know, we... And it's not a defensiveness in the dance community, necessarily, or... Uh, it's the only thing that I haven't, exp I haven't gotten as much interest. Right. I have, we are starting to get interest from campuses, which thrills mm. me, because composition right. programs need it desperately. Right. Desperately, because that's, of course, where some of the most brutal stuff goes on. So I'm, I'm pleased with that. Right. But I would say it's been slow in the dance world. But it's, it, I, I don't need to be a missionary about it if it comes, it comes. In fact, I was thinking it's nice I'm not a professional about the critical response process. It's just an aspect of my work. You know? Right. I yeah. can bring it with me. It's something I can do, but I'm not hawking it or, right. sure. you know, saying <laughs> do this thing. And that feels kind of good.
Then yesterday you had um, um, master class for area dancers as well as a, a gathering for non-dancers, which is really um, also an aspect of your work that I think has had an impact nationwide mm. in terms of just having dance get out of its um, at times hermetic kind of um, small closed community and, and having it have an impact and a reach um, outside of that community. Um, and, um, and then you, tonight you have a three performance run at the Southern Theater. Um, and I thought before we get into some of the bigger questions mm -hmm. that I want to ask you about the dance landscape and the cultural landscape that we're existing at this moment in time, um, you're performing three works at the Southern and the first or one of the pieces is a piece that you and I have <laughs> been, been involved with for years, which is a you know which I can't wait to see again because I know oh, it's, it's really, developed. You even. are you're gonna be amazed. Um, but could you just tell us about Shekianu and the section that we're gonna see is Faith and Science yeah. in the Midway, and this has been a major project of yours yes, for three years. Three years, um, and you're new moving into a new phase. Um, whether it stays Hallelujah or not as a title, but starting thinking about another very large project. Oh. But tell us about the development of Shehekiano. Well, yes, I'd love to. Maybe it'll <laughs> get clearer to me by talking about it. Well, Faith and Science, I now completely love. And you, let's see, our history of it is that you were involved in it, and in fact, we began our very first work on it at the Flint. At the Flint, you're right. When you were there. Right. And our and very You were playing around with a lot of concepts. Oh, my. And, Weren't we? Um, and then we came back to, to the Flynn that year and did a work in progress version of it, right. which had incorporated in it some of the characters and ideas that the piece continued to have. Now, the piece is still complicated, and I suspect a criticism of Shekhiano ultimately is that it perhaps has too many ideas, although for me, in faith and science, they're woven together really clearly now. Um, what, what uh, Shehekianu originally was about to me was, first of all, this beautiful prayer. A it's, Hebrew prayer it's a, that it, means... It's um, a blessing. I love hearing your description yeah. of it. <laughs> well, the traditional uh, translation is um, uh, uh, thanks for being uh, given life or breath, right. being sustained and brought to this moment, which is actually such a wonderful idea. Mm. Um, Kind of Buddhist, really. I yeah. mean, this idea of, of, and I think in the in the most uh, traditional Hebrew sense, it's probably about uh, that you're in this moment, and therefore you know something about God's presence. For me, that's mm -hmm. been less powerful. The part that interests me is it's just so amazing that you know here we are in this room, and here's Amanda filming, and you're here, and <laughs> I'm here, and here we are in Minneapolis. How did we all get here? How did that happen? <laughs> and wow. Um, it's, and it's a little bit more than just irony and coincidence. There, I mean, it is that, but it's just um, acknowledging these unexpected connections in our lives, which I think, now this is the, I don't know that this reads in the piece, but I think this is what has sustained me in my development of it, is my belief that as much as I adore being Jewish, sometimes being Jewish gets in the way of my connecting to somebody else. Hmm. As much as I love being a, a woman and a feminist and a mom, that all the ways that I am who I am sometimes preclude me from seeing other connections I might have with huh. people. And right. what about those unexpected connections that are also very sustaining to us? And it's not that I don't want to be Jewish, I don't want to be a feminist, I don't, it's all that is true. I just want to understand how I can be permeable. Right. Okay. Now, I think ultimately one of our biggest problems around all that is history. So the piece, this, this is not going to read in, this, in Act 1. Right. By the time I finish Act 3, I hope this is going to read. And it has to do with um, what do we do about our history? What of our history, personal and otherwise, do I bring forward and uh, complete with all its scars? Right. And what do I say? I don't need it anymore. And you know, as a Jew, I think this is just a major question. I mean, I grew up, I'm the generation that grew up, never forget. Right. Just never. Right. And it's not that I want to forget. But the even. Holocaust. But on the other hand, it is not here before my eye in everything that I do. In fact, I would like to be a Jew for which the Holocaust is not the central right. location of right. my Jewishness. Right. Mm. So, with that as background, what has happened to faith and science now uh, is that I, it's three stories going on simultaneously. One story is the prayer. Uh, sort right. of 
exploration of the prayer, and the prayer comes and goes. One story is the 1904 St. Louis World's Fair and events that took place there. And one story is these unexpected connections between people and between history. Mm. And it's just woven together and with a sort of a, um, certain historical characters emerging in the context of it. And, and I think it's pretty complete now. Mm. There's you've, one, you've I just I, concluded, uh, uh, finished th um, third act? Um, no, I'm in the midst of the, the third of, uh -huh. right now. Right. Oh, it's giving me such a hard time. And it's my suspicion that the reason Hallelujah is emerging is that the difficulty of these three sections of Shekinah, the incredible, and this came up in the dancing writing panel the other uh -huh. night, was right. this, uh, the, the issue is that in dance, not all ideas are translatable right. through movement. Hmm. That's when we started to talk. Some ideas, you just, they just, they're not dance-based. Right. I feel like I've been occupying this, t digging up the earth basically for three years about a whole bunch of stuff, and I'm, I feel like I'm ready to emerge into a much more intuitive, emotional, physical, abstract perhaps, hmm. under t understanding of how great it is to have made it to this moment. Hmm. And that's where I think Halley is coming from. Whereas Shekianu is more looking at it in a, in a somewhat um, specific and really what were, the, what were the threads that brought us here and historical and um, ethnic and uh, geographical and things like that. Concrete, literal, right. uh, specific narrative right. driven by, you know, it's like a, it's really theater. And in part three, I'm even having to develop dialogue, which I hate, as opposed to monologue, which is much easier. Right. You know, it's just really, it, huh. but um, yeah, it's very interesting. So what's part, fun about part three is that a bunch of characters from part one have emerged. It's sort of very interesting to see their evolution. We're having a really interesting time with that, if I can pull it together, which we'll see. When will that? It premieres in June. June. All three parts. Wow, great. And at, uh, at what, uh... in, in La at Landsberg's uh -huh. for our home season. Yeah. And um, I'm really happy. I, I, I mean, my feeling right now is we'll do it. Right. And in the best Lerman tradition, we will put the piece away for probably six months to nine months. Uh -huh. And then we'll bring it out again and fix it because we have <laughs> we have interest in it from some very interesting places, huh. and I'd love to bring it back as an evening length work. Um. Um, and one of the places that's interested in it is a thing called Facing History, hmm. which um, it's this amazing organization that sets up these uh, uh, wonderful. They just did a whole big conference on reparations and uh, reconciliation with the South African Truth Commission and. Uh, hmm. um, where are so, they based? Uh -huh. um, their home base is Boston, but they have uh -huh. outlets in many places. And right. this is for their conference in two years. Uh -huh. And, and uh, so I, I think that there's some really interesting ways to use the piece, which right. I'll understand better when it's done, including being a kickoff to, um, to Hallelujah, which I'm really excited about. But um, while we made Shehekiano, and all of its exhaustion <laughs> has been uh, these other little pieces that have just, you know. I was going to say, I, I can't, you know, there's two 1996 just yeah. pieces created last year, Nocturnes and uh, Fresh, Blood. Fresh Blood. Yeah, well, yeah. Fresh Blood just got fit. I mean, oh, we really? premiered it in December, so uh -huh. I really think of it as a, as a this year piece. But Nocturnes, um, yeah, Nocturnes is really, um, it's a really sweet piece. Huh. Very uh, sweet. Um, it's very fun to work with Willie Nelson's music. And oh yeah, right. Yeah. It's very fun. I'm anxious to see. Yeah, it. I yeah. think, and it's a, it's a, you know, it's one of those pieces that, uh, I, I don't know. You really, by Is the time you see it, you, get, you, by the time it comes, it's the last piece in this program. You, you know the dancers, and you've become attentive to the particular people in the company, and then you get to see them do some really beautiful things, right. like uh, Judy Jordan, who's the oldest person in the company, uh, does a solo to um, his version of Unchained Melody. All my love, mm. my darling, a hunger for your kiss. Oh, you know? yeah. The, yeah. I, I, and his version of that is so, so, beautiful. so beautiful, yeah. It's so beautiful. So Judy is how old? She's now? 73 now. Mm -hmm. She maybe already have had a birthday. I don't know. She might be older. but right. And honestly, it's just unbelievable. So that's yeah. really nice. And then Fresh Blood, well, it's out there. Philip, I'd be so interested what you have to say about Fresh Blood because we'll it have is a, really out there. Our own re re critical response. Yes, so I'll ask great. you what you're comfortable in. <laughs> my. I'll be so, well, you know, no, do, you know, to do you know his music, Steve Elson's music? Sure, yeah, I know it from um, some of the work he's done with people at yeah. DTW and things like that, and yeah. mainly in a dance context. Yeah, uh, he's, it's great music. Huh. It's really fun. And, uh, you know, we have two new company members, Giselle, who's from Minneapolis. Oh, yeah, And Mark right. Whitman, who's from Vermont. Right. Yeah, she was at Bennington all those years. That's right. Yeah. Where you see her. Huh. 
So you're really pleased with your current oh, company? God. And They're so beautiful. I, I can't say that I don't miss the people who aren't with me this year, who were with me for a long time. I miss right. them. Is Kimberly? But Kim is on leave. Yeah. Uh -huh. And B, B is actually um, going to be working with me on all kinds of Jewish stuff in the future. Oh, so really? So we're, we're oh, cooking great. up a, a great little future together, which I'm very happy about. Kim, uh, Kim, I'm not sure where things will go, but she's doing great work. She's out there and doing her thing, which is really good. One of the interesting things, um, I mean, from a historical perspective about your company. I mean, obviously, you've brought in people not just of what you're known nationally for of a wide range of ages from, what, the early 20s to mid-70s or so, but you have people from such divergent backgrounds and a wide range of, um, I mean, of body shapes and of um, ethnic and racial backgrounds and of points of view and of um, sexual preference and and how do you keep everybody mm. together <laughs> I mean I mean have you found it a process that um, is a constant struggle in terms of uh, I know you've made reference to the fact that these different kind of world views that exist from the older middle year people and younger generations and um, how has it informed your work and is, is it has that been a conscious process of of put of having such um, such a range of people in your company and then seeing sort of what results from that? Well, I think the answer to the last question is, I think it's been conscious. Right. And uh, of deep curiosity to me. Um, I used to say that when you have only one of something, things don't change, that you need two of something. It's like in my, in my household with me being Jewish and John not being Jewish. Once mm. Anna was born and we had two Jews in the house, well, things changed. <laughs> so when you have two of something, right. it, it really changes things. Yeah. When you have four of something, like I have four people in their 20s, things really change. And I think that's why the generational stuff is coming up as strongly as it is in these last few years, because right. this, this particular generation is um, as represented by these four people. Is uh, really uniquely different. Hmm. And I feel um, challenged, and I also feel that they've been a gift to hmm. help me understand things about the future that I don't, it's gonna make it easier for me to be with my daughter too. Hmm. They, it's definitely a different view, and it's coming up a little bit in part three of Shaking On I think it'll come up in a big way in Hallelujah. Different in the well, sense, it's not a, you're not despairing about it then, I mean there's, uh, the, uh, no, I don't, I'm because not despairing. You've mentioned a cynicism that exists in a 20-something in a generation that maybe doesn't exist. Uh, I think you've said an irony that exists in, right, in, in, in the sort of 30s and 40s, and a, for older people... Sort of hopefulness, A hopefulness, really. which would seem that there's this, would imply a sort of downward spiral of, of mm -hmm. from optimism to pessimism in a certain way, but, but you also find gratifying um, I mean, the things that give you hope and things that give you new ideas and inspiration. Definitely. From. Definitely. See, partly I feel like their cynicism is not entirely real, just like our irony isn't entirely real. By that I mean I think that they manipulate it, uh, like I manipulate irony. I'm not always an ironic person. Right. I think irony is just a very powerful tool for me to deal with my disappointments. Hmm. And uh, whether, say, that's the disappointment of the government. Right. The way I would express that is through a certain kind of satire and irony. Right. Now, the way they would express it is through a definite kind of cynicism. Hmm. I don't necessarily think they are at heart cynical people. Right. And actually, it's come up around this character of, of Roosevelt, because Teddy Roosevelt appears in part one, and at part, the, in part three, we're, trying to, we're thinking about all the 20th century presidents, and we're sort of right now working in this valley of broken statues of presidents, and hmm. Jeffrey, we're trying to figure out what Jeffrey is in all of that. And, um, Jeffrey's one of the uh, it's one, people in the company. Or, yeah, 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 he's right. actually, he's, I can't believe it, he's 26 or 26. 7 now. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, he's four years older than he used to be. Right. But he, um, we were talking about um, Clinton and Gore one day, and I said something like, it was right after the fundraising scandal stuff. Right. You know, and I cannot, I cannot believe this. Uh, you know, how can, how can they? Uh, right. And Jeffrey looked at me, and he's just cool as a cucumber, and he said, well, I don't know why you'd expect anything different. I mean, I never had any expectations that they wouldn't do that. Hmm. And that therein is a massive 
difference right. between my experience of growing up with having seen the civil rights movement, that you can make change, right. that you can create a different world, a belief that you have affect and you can affect things and change things. This generation hmm. doesn't even start from that place. Does it mean that everything is more on a personal level? Well, certain... they definitely are. I think they are extremely, right. very right. personal. But they have tons of incredible energy. They're very funny, hmm. very funny. They, um, there's a, a, a speed, quickness that isn't right. just youth. Uh, there's something. Do you think it's uh, media informed? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. And a certain, um, certainly a, a curious form of aesthetics. It's very eclectic all over hmm. the map. In, mm. Even more so than say than say mine, and definitely no earnestness. I mean, that's one of the big jokes in the company. <laughs> <laughs> How earnest I am! You know, I'll go on and on about art and community, and then we're talking, say, about the new school we're going to have in the right. exchange, and I'll be talking about okay, you know, and they, they'll listen to me talking. Then one say, why don't we just say get real? Wouldn't that work? Is that sort of <laughs> work? <laughs> I think that's pretty great. Have you have you found it um, encouraging? I mean, 20 years ago when you started the company. It was a radical notion to, to the thought of having such a diverse group of people on stage, in particular people in their 60s and 70s. And now it's not such a radical mm -hmm. notion. I mean, there are many companies who are um, using a full range of ages um, and uh, backgrounds in, in company work. And do you, have you found that an encouraging trend? And, um, I, I think it's great. I, yeah. I, I, of course, would wish for more. Right. Uh, what I particularly wish for is sustenance of it, not just as a one-piece thing. I'm going to make a piece using so-and-so, and then I'm going to drop it. I, right. would, I would prefer to see long-term. But you may be seeing that in ways that I'm not, because I, I may be less aware of who's actually able to sustain work out there. I know that there are... Um, there's a lot of experimentation going on with exactly how to formulate this. Like with Stuart right. traveling, with Stuart Pimsler traveling sure. with his health piece and bringing not his company along, but bringing the health workers that he made the piece with who are his touring company for that piece. Right. Things like that, which I think is thrilling. I mean, yeah. I'm just very curious about how that all evolves. Yeah. What I think one thing that's happened to me and why I may be trying to push them, the the um, and push myself for it is why we want to come home and have the school. Right. Is in fact to have a school for older adults so that people could retire and study seriously hmm. to become dancers. Because there is no way for that right. to happen. Right. Unless you happen to be in a company like mine and I only have four slots. Outside of someone taking a master class now and then or That's studying, right. you know, but not really with that kind of um, seriousness. Not really with the idea that you would really work at this, really get good at this, right. and go out and find a company or form a company or develop something and become artists because in fact it is a demographic future. We have, and yeah. because obviously that is the way the age is moving in our society at the moment but um, I know this but for the sake of the camera and uh -huh. history um, <laughs> what do you find in older dancers that when your skeptics say to you well but you know they just can't they're not they can't move you know mm -hmm. physically they can't move as beautifully as someone in their 20s or whatever I mean what is it that you find there yeah. that speaks to you and to audiences. Well, you know, it's also been changing a little bit, or mm. maybe I'm being changed by the landscape of, of the whole process of aging, because when I first started, um, there, old people were basically warehoused. There was no idea of conscious aging. Not, you didn't see old people doing line dancing or jogging. jogging or, or, well, you didn't see anybody jogging, because this is actually pre-public pre right. display of anything physical. But um, huh. the, uh, and I was just enchanted by um, the, uh, the c a combination of the beauty of the gesture itself, like a hand to a lined, totally lined face this way. Just the, the, the beauty of the gesture uh, and the courage of the performer, the boldness of that movement. Hmm. Uh, I don't mean that this is such a bold movement, but if no, they tried... But the just, honesty sort of thing. Yeah, right. it, was just, I, I could, it was so... It was precisely what was lacking to me in any trained person I worked with. Right. And that I always felt like if I brought the trained person in contact with that, that there was an osmosis, that, the, that in fact, those, the older dancers got to be better dancers faster hmm. by the very context of our work. But the young dancers gave up that veneer right. a lot faster hmm. because of the relationship. And I always, that was just always enchanting to me. So that was one thing. Secondly, I really love the stories they brought. Hmm. I always think about the piece we did called The Perfect Ten, which we did about, um, I don't know, seven, eight years ago. But um, everybody had to tell a story about something that happened in 10 minutes. And, you know, uh, 
uh, Judy Jordan says, who's still with the company, says something like, mm. well, you can be born, ten months you can die, but you can't get divorced. In 10 <laughs> and she is in the middle of it, like this really protracted, you know. But right. just having this 65-year-old woman say that is just ridiculously funny. Right. And right. really great. Huh. So I like that part of it. Now, however, I am finding, because both the two most recent members of the company who are older, Andy Torres and Martha Whitman, are both people who were professional dancers. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's evolving now is all the people who haven't stopped, who want to keep going. Right. And Who are sort of um, lost. I mean, not lost, mm -hmm. but unseen out unseen. there. Unseen. Yeah. Unseen is exactly right. Right. Now, Andy was totally unseen. He was teaching an, an outreach class in, in a ballet company in Columbus. Right. And this guy is just amazing. Hmm. Um, he's amazing uh, on stage, he's amazing off stage, um, the history he brings. He took, uh, incidentally, he took uh, Jola's uh, Haitian dance class the other night. Oh, and really? When Caroline Palmer came the next morning to, to interview me about something, she'd right. been in class with him. She said, was one of your dancers there? And she started to talk about how Andy was in class, and of course they went nuts for him. Huh. She said to me, now of course he couldn't do everything, so he'd say when he wasn't dancing, he was at the side playing rhythms on the radiator, but then every now and then he'd go across the floor and he'd stop the class and everyone would cheer. Huh. It's that, it's, see, there, there's, right. there's this thing that happens that has to do with courage and beauty and um, I would only say a lost sense of, um, I don't want to say community, it's not really that, but you know, we... The full range of sort of in human... People yeah, that you just right. want to be around and why right. cut that off? Right. If, if I had to spend 22 weeks on the road with everybody under the age of 30, forget it. Right. I would be, I mean, I, could, I just couldn't. So that's, you know, Andy offers that, and then of course he's just got so many skills from his eclectic background, which you don't get those kind of eclectic backgrounds anymore, I don't think, mm. you know, Broadway, this, that, and everything. Now Martha Whitman's a whole other story. Here's a woman who danced with Sokolow, danced with Humphrey, mm. left to go have a family and teach at Bennington College. She's up there for 35 years teaching, brilliant teacher, gets fired by the with this Stupid, huge, ridiculous change of dumb Bennington. thing yeah. to downsize right. and let go of somebody who's as brilliant as Martha is like nuts. But in the end, I'm so glad they did it because I called her and she came and huh. she what she has brought. You you won't believe what she's brought to the company. Oh, I can't wait. She to is. You really have brought in a whole chapter of, in some ways, dance history, kinesthetic as well as sort of intellectual history into your company that otherwise. You know, might have been, um, you know, just it's probably informing your work in, a, in an well, interesting way. You'll definitely see that in Fresh Blood. Huh. You'll see Martha beginning, really, to the other two pieces she had to learn rep, but right. you'll see the impact. The other thing that, that she's doing, and this is interesting because it relates to the generational issue, and it's giving me a lot of food for thought. And when you said, Am I sometimes troubled by all the tensions between the differences? Yes, I am. And one of the ways that I'm really troubled is people's work habits. Hmm. And I didn't realize how far away I had come from even my own work habits in the studio. Uh, till Martha came because Martha mm. is real old world. She's not an old world mover. She's a postmodern mover, which is to her credit. She's yeah. one of the few people I've met of her generation that can do the. Is really postmodern. She's right. not in this Graham kind of Asker, thing. Yeah. She's not. She's somewhere else. But her work habits are totally different mm. from the, the kids. She's early. She's ready. When um, when she's not on stage being worked on. She's on the side practicing. Hmm. I now remember everything everybody ever told me growing up that I had forgotten to tell the people that I know in their 20s. Right. She, um, all I have to do is say and, and she's ready to go. Huh. She doesn't talk in between things. Right. She doesn't laugh that much. She's, Interesting. It is yeah. a massive difference. And I know yeah. some of it's my laxness, and I could, I, I see now it's my laxness, and I have, a, I have to start tightening the ship. But it's not only my laxness. Hmm. It's a different world. Hmm. Do you find, um, I mean, is it, do you find it, with the work that you've been doing, the work I appreciate and see a lot and things like that, surprising that there is still such a strong following for work that is more about the surface beauty of the human body and that kind of hype, super trained, you know, that whole dance world still moves forward mm -hmm. unchanged? Or do you find that there's a place for everything and that's fine and all of that? Well, that's a really interesting question, Philip. I, I, it's really, I ask myself that a lot. 
I, I think I'd like to believe about myself <laughs> that I think it's not either or. Right. And that there should be a spectrum of possibility. I would be happiest if at whatever people were doing, they did it from a place of questioning. Hmm. Like, right. Why am I doing this? And what is it about this that I'm compelled to do now? What am I speaking to? And I guess in that sense, I would yearn for some uh, willingness to look at the values that are represented by the choices we make, like a hundred thousand dollars for a set or a piece that uh, Re I don't know. requires people to pay sixty-five dollars to come and see it or yeah, whatever. Yeah, all that stuff. So uh, from from internally, from inside the art world, I would yearn for more um, assumption bashing. Mm -hmm about what it is we really think we are doing. For example, if I was going to talk about my, my values around quality, I would list technique among them. Right. But it would not be the top one. But I would list it. It's an, a very important quality to What me. would be the top one? I don't know if I have a top one. I have a group of them. Mm -hmm. Technique. Um, more, much more important than technique to me is the commitment of the individual to the movement that they are doing hmm. and an understanding as to why they're doing it. Right. If they, if they do the movement with commitment because they understand why they're being asked to do it and they are connected to it in the moment, it will be incredible. Hmm. And when that's gone, I'm very unhappy. That's why I'm not happy at a lot of dance concerts because right. I don't think a lot of people think about that. Right. Um, so that's a really high value for me. Hmm. So is, uh, here's another one which is, I don't think many people think about. What is the impact of this on my community? Right. What does this mean? Right. That's, that's an art value to me. That is not a secondary value, and that is not a separate value. That is an art value. It is incorporated into what it is that we are doing. It just And my answer could be, for example, a piece about fresh blood. I could say that the impact on my community is small, that the piece matters because it allows my company to show off. Right. It has a strategic quality to it because I want to pull people along because um, balance I, is a program it, it, it push it you know there are all kinds right. of ways that I could describe why it exists and, and it so they don't all have to say oh I'm gonna make a better world right I don't mean that right I just mean a clarity about why and I see I but there are there is a paradigm of a whole group, part of the dance world and the, the performing arts world in general that um, to create an entertaining hour and a half um, that is well done is the end uh, in and of itself. And so it seems that you start from a very different place and there may be a difficulty ever, you know, finding, I mean, that, that's why I asked the question, mm -hmm. that it, you know, do, do you feel even that that other side is, is, uh, has a credibility in a certain way? And um, in some ways, your focus on how artwork can impact on community is I see the other major impact you've had on mm. the world, on the cultural landscape, um, in the sense that the, even the concept that dance, uh, uh, for, for, you know, concert dance and um, choreography can actually address social and community issues is something that was really sort of, in some ways, unheard of, um, you know, 30 years ago. Um, and I, I guess I, I'd like to ask, what, what do you think it is about say the arts, the performing arts, or dance in particular, that makes it uniquely suited to grapple with issues of, of community, issues that we struggle with as people in our communities or in our world. Um, how, do, how, do you, how did you come mm -hmm. to the point, maybe it was way long ago when you were very young, but to realize that dance, which often had been seen as a way to, at least in a Western society, to entertain or to to bring beauty in this way could be used in a different way to address issues um, that are really uh, beyond the, the stage mm -hmm. itself. Uh, well, it's a big question, but I. Uh, but you know, I think what's interesting is even just starting with the idea about entertainment and beauty, both of which are important. Right. So, one thing I've been working on lately is trying to figure out how to not set up that dichotomy not necessarily. Not that either yeah. or stuff, right. only because. I, I realized lately that that I think that's the I think that's a big problem because that people view it in that either way. Or. So, yeah, because the, some of your pieces that have had some of the most meaning, you know, have been you have used humor and humanity and entertainment qualities totally. that totally get them in under someone's in fact, skin. In uh, typically, they're better than. 
the, huh. the idea pieces. I think the idea, I, I've decided, this is a little tangent and then I'll come back to your question. I've decided that these idea pieces are um, um, really, really essential. I, I could not move without them. Right. Um, and I've decided they're a lot like fertilizer. And they, um, uh, even if they aren't as effective as some of the little pieces, um, I couldn't only make the little pieces. I wouldn't go anywhere. Right. And, and it sort of brings me around to John Cage. Hmm. In an odd way, I start linking myself a lot to him because I think hmm. a lot about how he did all that weird music, right? And then he did all that great writing. Right. Now, nobody ever said to him, stop doing the music, just, just write. <laughs> your writing is so good. <laughs> Don't do the music part. It's not as good as your writing. Right. The only way he could write was because he did the music. And the only way he could do that music was because he wrote. Right. I really believe that about him. Hmm. I never met him. I don't know. But I really believe that there is some clear link and partnership in how he thinks. Right. And I feel like I'm like that. Right. I feel like I do my, some of my best thinking when I slog my way through something like Shakiano. Mm. And that in the midst of making that piece, I am learning so much. I am confronting so much. I am getting so much clearer about a zillion things that will affect me on beyond the piece. Mm. And that typically, the piece that follows one of these big idea pieces, I do them about every five years. They're always fabulous. Right. They're always like, huh. you know, they're like trampolines that just go whoosh, you know? huh. So that's, that's, that's sort of like a little piece. But, but as to the question about um, the reason the either or thing I think is so scary is that if, if your world is either or, and here's concert, and here's community, or here's quality, and here's whatever, yeah. I think that people who are up here, the only thing they can imagine is that. I see. I mean, that's the only world they can imagine. They only can then see themselves on the bottom, and that's why they're so terrified. They can't even Very imagine this. Yeah, right. They can't, they can't even, and I have to say, for the people that have been down here, it's so bruising to get here. They don't always want to stop here. Right. I mean, Are we there now? No, I don't think we're there yet. Some, actually, we may be, and I may not be able to see that we are, because right. I'm one of these people, you know, and I feel like, oh. But no, I suspect we are. I, right. think, I think we are much closer. Mm -hmm. And to then for and say that, of course, there's a place in the world for people doing just entertainment and just um, beauty. And hopefully they will push that envelope really far, mm. and I can borrow from what they have come right. to understand, like river dance. Right. Now, river dance is interesting in relation to Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I've been watching it a lot on TV, and I'm going to try to see it this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an example. Here's something that I really pushed way out there right. in some ways that I could care less about. Right. But there is something going on, and I'm going to borrow from their playbook. Hmm. I haven't seen Riverdance um, other than s clips of it. Mm -hmm. It is having an impact uh, broadly in some ways. I find it interesting, though, that some of the work that I've always loved, too, does come from tradition. You know, traditions. Um, that they sprung from, that river dance use, uses to gain its power. And there's people like Rhythm and Shoes and mm -hmm. traditional Irish step dancers who we've presented at the Flynn, and, you know, others that, that, you know, maintain that power. And somehow they just took it and sort of expanded it in some way, as I understand they, it. They have actually the piece that, um, in this case, I'm less interested in what they did to their form. I right. probably would have more problems with what they did with their traditions than I am about the nature of what is it that attracts the audience so much to it. Uh -huh. And right. it has something to do with scale. Hmm. And that's, that's where I want to work with Hallelujah. I see. I want to push this scale question. It, uh, the one clip I've seen is what, uh, maybe it's towards the end of the piece, where like dancers they or come something. swooping <laughs> right. down in that line, you right. know? And uh, I'm sure that that's extremely um, affecting to an audience person, which goes back now to your question about the power of dance. Um, I, I really believe that on some deep level that um, dancing has so much more power in it than we have attributed it mm -hmm. in our culture. And that um, the way for people to comprehend that best is to do it. Hmm. Yes, you can sit in river dance, and the music is really loud, so the pumping, the bass sounds are probably Shaking moving your, your yeah. chair. Right. And 80 people come sweeping at you in unison. And for a moment, it might be like being at the edge of a field when you were praying for something and it was your spring festival and right. your life depended on it. Hmm. Maybe for a split second right. you could get that from your seat. But mostly I think people get it these days if they do it, which is why I am so 
insistent about participation, not, not uh, I, I just don't know how else. It seems to me it's the best way for people to discover that it's, that it's useful right. to them, has a mm. place in their lives. Whether, I don't want them all to be dancers, right. particularly. Although I think basically once people have a good experience with it, it's hard for them to let it go. Mm. And they look for ways to continue having it. And that's why, you know, I like doing the stuff in the synagogues and the stuff over here. Because I think it's, it's pretty interesting to see what happens. And do you continue to see, I've seen it uh, a number of times when we've worked t together. I've seen it in other situations. But do you continue to find sustenance from when you walk into a, a community setting with your company and you introduce movement, the, even the concept of people moving, and when they never thought of themselves as doing anything like that, do you still find that transformative for them and transformative for you? Um, I, I do. I do. It's, it's a little, it takes more now only because I've done it for so long. Right. But like le recently we did a little thing in Spartanburg, South Carolina, and we had been asked to come in. Uh, actually, the ballet company sponsored us, mm. and they were working with a group called Stop the Violence or something. We went into this room and the g group that had gathered was the most unlikely group of people. Community policemen, hmm. a group of, um, say, eight to 18-year-old black kids and their leaders, and a group of old people from an hour and a half away who were dancing with a modern dancer who had brought them all the way over to work with me. What a wild, interesting mix yeah. of people. <laughs> yeah. And honestly, I guess what really moved me were the policemen. Huh in their full uniforms. We did this one thing where one person closes their eyes and the other person has their eyes open and leads them around, you know. And there were these kids leading these policemen around the room. Huh. I mean, I thought my heart really would break. I thought, now this is just such an astonishing way for this community, given what's going on between policemen and their right. communities. And young black men. And, and all uh, that. And here, and these guys, these policemen just had their, they were just so, okay. Uh, you know, I, I, it was really amazing to me. Uh, so in moments like that, I'm just struck with how lucky I am right. to know a little something that might help. And then, you know, plus, of course, and here we're back to the art. The moment in which the person came over and took the hand of the policeman and this, the way this person's face changed as the hand came, I mean, it's as beautiful as anything right, you right. could ever see. Yeah. So it's not a question to me about aesthetics anymore. Right. It's not just, oh, let's do, do something good for the community. It is clearly an absolutely beautiful moment of art. Mm. So I, I, I'm um, happy for that. I, I think my own role, however, is going to be less doing like that right. and more teaching um, others to be able to yeah and that's why you're setting up a series of um, I mean some sort of in some ways institutes I know in New England we've been mm -hmm. in conversation and places that artists can come choreographers or even those that are not but and learn some of the things that you've learned over mm -hmm. the years and how to make make those transformations within their own communities and things like that. I would be so. much happier for other people to be doing it than right. us. And, I, and, and to the extent that, yes, I'm glad, is your earlier question, that there's more older people dancing and they're more, you know, there still is such, there's still some resistance, with, which I wish would just go away in the art world. That's why we really need to do right. this, because the resistance is stupid. It's dumb for us to be fighting this anymore. And maybe, right. maybe I'm the one who could say more and more about, yes, I love that you're doing the dances you're doing and come look at this mm -hmm. rather than making maybe I contribute to the either or quality and should change that but well I think there's issues know. of funding and um, reduction of presentation opportunities that all feed See, into I that know it feeds of, into that that right. sense of oh my god but you know it's it's funny because um, and this is where we need it would be nice to do have some more research and analysis is to really research where the dollars are going. I know right. it seems, especially when Lila Wallace gives, for example, gives me such a generous gift. Right, congratulations. It's, it's really great. huge yeah. and wonderful and amazing. But I know that how that reads out there. Right. It reads a certain kind of panic, right. um, which, is, which is why I wish we could also, at the same time, show all the other the Malin money, sure. the Pew money, right. the other money, which, you know. Not are, to mention you know. corporate sponsorship and yeah. other major. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, the world is changing and it's not changing enough to help people, to help people see that. But right. I do think, and here maybe I'm, maybe I'm um, in the really big picture, I don't think people will survive if they do not take on some 
understanding about their relationship to the community around them. Hmm. I don't think they will make it. Right. I just don't. And it's not just because the funders are changing. Yeah. The world is changing. Right. People are changing. They won't make it. Hmm. Maybe a few will. Right. Maybe a few will. But um, all of the individuals who've supported that kind of work all these years, the symphonies and the ballets, even the families that have given them all that money, those kids aren't giving. Right. Those kids are doing something else. Yeah. The least those kids are doing is they're servicing their own children. So you're going to at least have to right. open up and say, hey, yeah. come and find out what we're doing. But given, given what's happening in the commercial world and the computer world and right. all that stuff, and the demands on people's time and things like that. That stuff. That's one of the big questions for us about our school, incidentally, is we're trying to figure out exactly what is the structure that people will actually leave their homes for and come out and do something. Because, hmm. I mean, you know how exhausted you are. We know, I mean. Right. And it is, I think, one of the big things that we all sort of Whoa. confront on, on, in the realm of putting on performances and encouraging people in residency activities and how do you get the people there. But um, I, I'm going to move for a second mm -hmm. into kind of the technique side. Okay. When you construct a work, mm -hmm. when you start going after it, you've got often, like you said, you've got ideas that you're grappling with, but you've got movement vocabulary mm -hmm. too. How do you go about, and maybe you might want to use one of the works we're going to see at the Southern, how do you go about the starting point and then the refinement of the development of the movement and how much of a role does your company play in that? Um, that's a, it's a great question, and there are lots of different ways to work. Um, uh, let me just work for a minute off of faith and science, yeah. and I'll give you a couple of ways we've worked, and then I'll take um, one of the, oh, Fresh Blood is so interesting because it was so different. Um, in faith and science, which started with the prayer, in fact, at the very first day at the Flint, I brought right. everybody these, the copies of the prayer. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And yeah. we just worked off the, literally, the shapes of the letters. And people w were doing some uh, the, sort of drawing, drawing of it, and, and it, with their bodies, with the letters. Shaping it, and right. of course it's just so exquisite. It's just... Did you know. find that that technique, that that led nicely into... We used a lot of that material. Huh. It was, it's right. beautiful. It was very physical, very formal, but right. very emotional. It Form, turned out... Formal in the formal. sense that you had it, it came from a, a certain concept and, and you used the formality of those letter shapes and things like that. Exactly. Right. Um, and formal as it was a lot about line. Right. Um, it was right. a lot about uh, what I would describe as sort of aesthetic issues. Yeah. Rhythm issues, energy. But it turned out that all the movement that emerged that day also could be made to be highly emotional depending on how we played with it and manipulated it. So that, that was one way. Another way we worked in Faith and Science was um, Jeffrey, in relation to Roosevelt's character, Jeffrey and I did a bunch of reading. Hmm. <clears throat> and then we went to the Smithsonian and actually looked up some films of him, got some hmm. little bit of ideas of, from his gestures. But um, sometimes I do this project with the dancers about um, <clears throat> um, trying to get the dancers to move out of their usual way of moving, their usual vocabulary. Hmm. We have a complicated, well, it's not so complicated, but we do this method. The, each person gets a turn to dance. They dance however they want to. We describe it in physical terms. No emotional terms, no image terms, purely mm -hmm. physical. You turn a lot on your right leg, your focus is usually out. You tend to insti in instigate movement from your fingertips as opposed, you know, not from mm -hmm. your right. mm -hmm. We go through that. Then we give them a list of things to do that, that we didn't see at all. So you base those original things on what they, how they move naturally, what their natural inclination is, and then you come up with things that are not part not. of theirs. Uh -huh. And then they have to go and make a phrase mm -hmm. based on the knots. It's right. really hard. And a knot can't be uh, don't don't move with your fingers. A knot has to be something to do because right. you have to right. know what to do. Yeah. So it could well. So I, I don't remember what Jeffrey's were that that year. What his new ones were. But he went. He made a phrase and he came back and I said, Jeffrey, that is Teddy Roosevelt to the core. Huh. I don't know why. It just felt totally like Teddy. So Teddy's movements in that piece grew out of these, you know, odd things. That right. And I think that's probably one of my best strengths, is my ability to make um, odd connections that help formulate pictures. Hmm. Now, that's an example of one right. of those. And then, um, and let's just take a look at Andy's character in that piece, because Andy's character is actually fairly, um, I think, um, provocative. So hmm. Andy and I are working on this idea about this uh, faith healer, a sort of uh, 
um, uh, healing people from malaria and stuff, which sort is very common. Sort of a common. charlatan. Yeah, thing. yeah, a little yeah. bit of that. But also because I'd been working on this whole thing about, because uh, the piece centers on this issue of being caged and being watched right. and right. Stere stereotypes, people being stereotyped. So I said to Andy one day, why don't you just show me all the stereotypes you know about black performers? And Andy's African-American, right? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's actually Puerto Rican-born. Uh-huh, right. But so he, of course, can do these things totally. I mean, they, it's really offensive in a way. Uh, there, and we built the entire piece on these stereotypes, except mm. that it's very funny. Mm. And then he does, he does it twice. He does it as the faith healer, and then he does it later as Odebenga the pygmy. Right. Um, and it's kind of shocking. Now, that's, um, I'm not sure how to categorize that, except that it's sort of subject matter based. Right. Um, Did you maintain, retain that? Uh -huh. that? It's in and the piece. But what have you spark, have sparks flown? Well, and, here's and what happened. After the first version of the piece, an uh, African American uh, person that I know came up to me and said, you make the black character do all the hard work. The Jewish character doesn't have to be care." caricatured, the Jewish character gets all the dignity. Hmm. Thought about that. They were right. So I went back and got this, we got this huge nose now on this Jewish character, which hmm. is very much like the original stereoscope that I saw of the Jewish character. She's called Schiffer the Palestinian Jewess. Huh. And she didn't have such a huge nose, but she was stereotyped in a lot of other ways at that period. She had a right. hookah. She huh. had a very uh, soft egg, very uh, exotic kind of tresses, like a sexual kind of come on, you know, right. which would have been right at the turn of the century for how they might have treated Jewish women in some uh. ways. So now the Jewish character has this big nose. Well, you should hear some Jewish audiences. Hmm. It's amazing. They see that nose and they go to Auschwitz. I mean, they just, they just go. Hmm. How can you do this? How can you be so offensive? And then I say back to them, well, I hope you were just as offended about Andy. Right. Or the Filipino who runs around in a little uh, diaper. Right. Huh? Right. <laughs> it's like, well, and of course it doesn't register because they don't even see it as stereotype. Right. stereotype. Right. And they quickly try to do this thing about who's worse off than that. Right. So, yes, there has been some issues come up for people from that which I think is pretty pretty powerful and pretty mm. interesting. Now, the Schiffer character, the nose doesn't stay on all the time. She takes it off other times, and she has, gets to be this Victorian person. And, then, mm. and as the piece evolves, the, the nose eventually gets to be like a little thing she wears around her, huh. like a little oh, thing that she'll yeah. do in the, the later sections. So those are examples of how the movement might have evolved in faith and science. Now, it's really different. The Willie pieces I worked almost entirely from um, did it come from a very personal place, listening to music, you're at home and things like that? Well, what happened is that John had the Stardust album. Oh, I love that and record. it's such yeah. a beautiful album, and I started to listen to it a lot. And right. I got this idea that it would be perfect to do for the seniors. And I decided to make just a couple of little pieces for the seniors. Because huh. I just felt like it would be fun Just the senior members of the your company. company. Yeah. yeah. So I did. I made a little quartet for the four of them to all mm. of me. And then I started working on this thing for Judy, and then I started working on this thing for Thomas. Well, then I started listening to more Willie Nelson. And I really liked a lot of it. Right. So all of a sudden I had eight dances, and then I dropped one of them. Mm. So it was very, very fun. And, you know, it turned out, it's interesting, that we made those pieces during a time of a fair amount of turmoil inside the company. Mm. And I really felt like the Willie Nelson pieces are um, as much about love, different mm. kinds of love, right. as they could be. And I think it was a really, really good antidote for me personally mm. during this stressful period. Mm. And then Fresh Blood, um, with Martha and Giselle joining the company, um, I had decided, and in this sense, Fresh Blood relates to part three of Shehakianu. Mm. Uh, they really cover the same territory in some respects. Part three of Shehakianu is a lot about um, what do you do about personal scars and historical scars that you carry with you, and how do you heal them? Do you heal them, and what if you didn't have them anymore? Would you still mm. be yourself, or would you not? Mm. And uh, I, I was working on these, these ideas with Shekiano, and I realized that fresh blood for me had some sense of, um, and this isn't, an audience wouldn't know this, the idea that when you have new people come into a group, just how a group adjusts and changes mm. and 
shares and doesn't share and all that. So those things were kind of all related to me. The way we made the piece, though, was really fun. I had everybody, it was the first day in the studio, brand new studio. Yeah, new, brand, yeah brand new studio It was Washington. amazing. Yeah. You know, we were in there. And uh, I had, I wanted to do a little ceremony, so I asked everybody to think about a time in their lives when they had been the most excellent student or the most excellent teacher. Hmm. When it was so wonderful. When they themselves. Uh -huh. And to bring that hmm. to our room. And uh, to make just one gesture from that. And then I had them go look around the building, because it was in a lot of disrepair, and pick one place in the building that was ugly and torn, and to make a gesture for that, or a movement for that. And then to come back and make one movement that was how beautiful the place would look one day. Hmm. So each person had the beginning of a phrase that had three little things to it. And then we did something I've, we've never done. We did a round robin. Oh, Everybody huh. went to another person and they had a movement added on. Right. And then, huh. after, then we reversed. Right. So everybody had this long phrase that had begun with their excellent student teacher, with this torn building, with this, ho and then with the contributions of the, their colleagues. Right. And that forms the movement material. Oh, really? For the piece, huh. along with a couple of images around how would you like um, get rid of scars? I mean, so mm. uh, thinking both scarring of the building and fixing the building, but also scarring of because there's like this this thing shows up a bunch of but so that that and then I had this great music and it came out so fast mm. it's like Phew. it's pretty it was pretty it's, fun do you find it interesting when an audience sees a work that comes out of a place where you've got a pretty specific idea of say the removal of scarring or coming from a building that mm -hmm. this audience will have no clue about what yeah. it is is it interesting to them to see their perceptions of it or do you hope that they will read in some of the origins of where it came from, or do you use those sources just to then, I mean, it's okay that it creates interesting sequence. It's like a starting point to create really interesting sequences of movements that, that are put together, or... or um, in, in Fresh Blood, I don't care. Yeah. In Fresh Blood, I think, because I think what the audience will get from Fresh Blood is energy. Uh-huh, um, right. Just energy. Now, when we perform that piece on tour in little tiny towns in Arizona, See, I think sophisticated art, art audiences will be the most comfortable with Fresh Blood. Mm -hmm. It is the most like modern dance as they have come right. to think of modern dance. Mm -hmm. Okay, But most lay audiences, it's the hardest piece to get. Right. There are no clues for them. Because of the abstraction, because yes. of the... Huh. So with them, I would come out, say, okay, Fresh Blood, this is... No, let me tell you, I'd say, this Where is this what... Where this piece started from. I'm interested in people coming, you know, how it is when there's a group of people in it. And I said, but I, you know... Don't worry if you don't see that. I said, it's a li what I think you should do is, you know when you're watching a football game or a basketball game, and you turn off the, the sound, and you just look at all that movement going on, and maybe you follow the ball, and maybe you don't. Right. And you do it like that. I said, you'll really have, but here's some clues, if you want some clues. I said, watch, um, I think it's interesting how energy works in a group. I said, but even that, look, here's a clue. Watch their clothes, because they do a lot of trading of clothes. And mm. I said, watch one movement and see if you can tell when the movement appears somewhere else on the stage or in somebody else's body. Mm. Because that's a little sign of a little shared energy. Huh. And that's how much I would, I would do. Right. See, I wouldn't tell your audiences this. Right. Although they probably love to know it. Well, I was going <laughs> to say, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, I think it's so funny that so few people, creators, um, you know, feel that they want, uh, you know, to do that kind of explanation or, or providing the, the providing of clues. Um, this was a big debate the other night. Uh-huh. Because I came out in favor of telling people. Right. And, and I have an opportunity in these program notes, but in these program notes I gave people clues to faith and science, but I did not give them clues to fresh blood. Like I just, I did say it's about new company members and we welcome them, but right. I did not say, hey, look for this. Watch this for energy yeah. movement. Right. Um, although if I was to speak publicly, I would. But I did give people structural information about faith and science. Three stories. Right. Here are the three stories. Hmm. They, everybody got very concerned the other night that if you tell people what it's about, then you rob them of the discovery. And when I keep telling, I think there's a way to tell, give people a handle without telling them what they're going to find out. Right. 
Well, I think we've all been at performances where there's a didactic sort of someone sort of saying, and then you'll see this, and then you'll see that, and that obviously isn't the way to do it, but there is, I think there's a way to do it. There it's should be, and it's that, something we could work on. Because there's then, the, the danger, if you don't, is there's that 70% of the audience that doesn't see a lot of modern dance or postmodern dance who feels like they've been left uninformed, mm -hmm. uh, if not insulted in some way, because, you know, that or, that, or they're left... Um, um, feeling um, not intelligent, like they didn't, yeah. they, they didn't get it right. in some way. So we run a little bit of a risk even here, but I sure. see here what we did is we put fresh blood first because basically we want to get the dance audience over sure. the hump. Hey, they know how to dance. Right. That's interesting. So we got that yeah. out of the way. Right. Then we can go to faith and science and they can get and then they can end with the willies and they have this, you know, sweet time. But right. in Arizona, we opened with the willies. Hmm. To bring them in. Yeah. Well, this has been um, great. It's so fun Thanks to live. To, it's uh, so fun. I think we covered a lot. Um, yeah. We um, is there, in, in closing. Is there any um, thing you'd like to say? I mean, if we are looking at this as a historical record about where we are right now, um, 1997, in the sort of state of our culture and where we're going, mm -hmm. are you pessimistic? We've obviously been through a lot of difficult. Um, issues um, in the arts and fights f over f money and people's feelings about the content explosions that we've the political travesties that are going on but where do you think we're going and, and are you optimistic generally well I think that um, we're gonna see a period where it's gonna feel like the arts are hiding but I don't think they are I think we're gonna see much more uh, partnership of artists inside other existing life forms mm. like clinics, right. synagogues, schools, um, health clubs, uh, you know, right. a huge range. And it'll feel to those of us who experienced something different in the 70s and 80s like we're dying. But actually, I think we will thrive mm. um, and get strong. And then I think what will start to happen is uh, either because the artists themselves will push hard and need more isolation again, or the communities will. But I mean, it's, it seems to me it's like a, like a little a pendulum kind right. of thing. Um, ideally, the, the model would be like the dance exchange model, where you have time for your own voice and you have time for, for this kind of partnership I'm talking about. But I think the, a lot of the support for art will find the support will come more in the partnerships than it will for the individual voice and it will be incumbent upon us to continue to carve out places for ourselves to have our own voice hmm. which I keep telling people it's not a contradiction between a strong private uh, individual vision and a communal obligation and celebration right. I don't feel that right. as a I don't feel in any way that and either, that is or, a contradiction. Right. Mm -hmm. I even think I can do these really provocative pieces, men kissing and all, you know, and work it through with the communities to which I am a part. Right. I just, I just feel like that's really possible. In in the long run, um, I I just I don't know how we're gonna. Um, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the big old bigger for me the bigger battle is commercial culture. Hmm. That's where I'm most, I'm most, most scared, is the extent to which how fast we are losing people to um, a belief that speed, action, um, everybody the same, uh, uh, swift, uh, cool, all how f I mean the kids are into that so young, right? And um, you know I know I'm too earnest. I know that's part of the problem, but I just don't know how, where, and how we're gonna be able to play with that and how much of where we're playing an alternative to that is class-based hmm. as a middle and upper class and what does that mean ultimately that right. scares me right that scares me so i'm i'm concerned about how we're going to counter that and how to make sure the countering of that includes people of all um parts of our communities right so that's that's my fear the one thing i also want to say before this tape goes off is that I owe you an incredible thank you that I think you are in, um, just such a, an amazing um, 
friend to artists because this is the thing about you that I really, and I put in my own program now, <laughs> now I'm going to put it on this tape because I want people to know this, is that you have um, uh, this interest that goes beyond just um, PAL and that I really feel you really want me to do good work. Hmm. I feel like you really want me to do good work and that you will hold me to a high standard, whatever that is. And you're willing to learn from me. I right. mean, I think you're willing to say, okay, show me what you think it is, Liz. But I also think that you uh, uh, demand on, in a very gentle way, a very persuasive way, the really good work. Hmm. And um, that I really appreciate. Oh, wow. Thanks. And um, I'm... I'm uh, very much looking forward to how things work for you here. I think the community here is really lucky to have you. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's it got to be an adventure. Yes, I think so. Um, thanks. And there's my ride. Yeah. It's <laughs> Great. Thanks.